Hi, I'm Jim Curtin, head coach of the Philadelphia Union, and I'm here to answer questions for Ask the Coach. Like every coaching career or playing career, it's a uh, it's a long journey with uh, a lot of highs and a lot of lows that we're we're humbling along the way. Um, you know, I think uh, I need to say too, I'm I'm not a coach that believes you had to have been a professional player to become a professional coach. That concept for me is is just silly, uh, to be honest. But I do have to talk about you know the environment I was in as a 20 year old as a professional. Um, in Chicago um, with head coach Bob Bradley was one where, gosh, 15 out of the 18 players are now coaching professionally in, in the world, uh, in different leagues in the world um, as, as coaches, as assisting coaches, as technical directors. So 15 out of 18, I was fortunate and, and lucky uh, to be thrown into that group. So as a 20 year old, um, you know, you're immature, you're young and you're, you're kind of foolish, but um, probably by my second year in that environment, um, I started to think the game as, the, as a coach because of the people that were around me. Um, you know, from there, the playing career came to an end, like, you know, like so many do, not on the terms uh, that you want, you know, and that's the, the humbling part of the game. Um, for me, it came at, at 30 years old. I won't bore you with the, the background, but essentially I was playing uh, in Los Angeles, um, you know, was kind of at a point where I wanted to go back to my hometown, which is Philadelphia, um, and, and try to play for my home team. Um, I thought it was fortunate at the time that the, the, the current head coach in Philly was uh, a former captain of mine, Peter Novak. Um, long story short, things didn't work out on that end, um, but it turned out to be a blessing for me because my coaching career started at age 30. You know, I, I dove right into um, coaching quite literally players age two to four years old, uh, in almost like a, uh, a trial by fire thing that the I think the academy set up threw me into to see um, how I would handle it. And look, for me, I have to say it was humbling. You know, you go from your last game as a professional was literally against uh, David Beckham and he, sc he scores to beat us. And, and now I'm in a park essentially, you know, babysitting two and, two and four year olds having balls blasted at me. And I'm thinking to myself, how did I get here? But, uh, you know, through that uh, little bit of uh, adversity, I, I, I started to really like and enjoy working with, with young, young players. So um, eventually got a job in the, the Philadelphia Union Youth Academy, worked with players age eight all the way through 18. Um, gosh, almost 10 of them now are professionals and play in our stadium now. So it's been cool to see that, that pathway and trajectory. So, um, you know, you know, I, I had some success at the U18 competition. That's, uh, you know, it's called the Generation Adidas Cup. It's basically uh, a national competition all the MLS teams play in. We won the competition, so I think some eyeballs started to point towards me. Um, I started doing, you know, film analysis and, and scouting reports for the first team, um, became an assistant coach for the first team, um, you know, and then, you know, like many managers, you come into the job um, not how you want to because someone had to lose their position. Um, I was 34 years old. I was the youngest coach in MLS. I can say right now I was not ready, <laughs> but I could not say no to my dream job to coach in my hometown city. Um, you know, the professional club here, just um, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I took it. Um, I learned a ton. I made mistakes. And fortunately, I had ownership that um, had a long term vision um, and I had seen the club at every level. And I think that was really valuable in my development. Uh, I, with the Youth Academy, I got to make mistakes. Uh, I, I got to try things. Um, I got to watch kids take information and grow and, and different things like that. So I would say that um, I would encourage all coaches to, to dive in with the youth because that um, is a really great uh, pathway. And like I said, um, having worked with a lot of those kids at eight, nine, 10 years old that are now um, you know, starting for us in the first team um, and playing for the U.S. national team, that's something that um, puts a little bit more ownership in the club. And I always say it, this badge is only, you know, two and a half inches, but it's bigger than any coach. It's bigger than any player. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the mentality of, that our club has. So that's a quick snapshot of, of you know, uh, the, the trajectory of my career. But, um, you yeah, know, still learning every day. And I think once you, you get to a point where you think you have all the answers, um, this game has a way of 
getting rid of you pretty quick too. So you have to always be adapting and adjusting. So like many, like many kids in, in the States, you know, I played whatever sport was in season. You know, I played basketball, I played baseball, I played um, track I, I, um, and I played soccer. Um, soccer was not popular. You know, it wasn't the, the game of choice. In, in some ways, it was considered a, a soft sport, which is completely shifted now. Um, it, it's grown so much over my, my time. But, you know, when I was, you know, age five through through high school years, um, it wasn't, you know, thought of as a, a a tough sport, you know, and again, I could I could talk for hours on the, the idiots in, in American football, but that's a, a whole different discussion. <laughs> but um, no, with the soccer side, you know, I, I came from an American football family, um, so I, I really was never coached uh, a ton. My father coached me and he did the best he could. But, um, you know, I, I think you're starting to see now more and more um, better coaching at a young level, which is it was really important in our league. But I played you know, like every American kid, whatever sport was in season, I was active, I was outside. And, and when it came time and I got to my, about my junior year of high school, which is right before university, um, in an attempt to save my parents some money with uh, the, the tuition, uh, I thought the best opportunity for me to get a scholarship was uh, in the sport of soccer. So I chose soccer. Um, it worked out for me and went on to university here and, and was lucky enough to get drafted by the Chicago Fire and have a 10 year career in MLS and now um, now into the, I got old and worthless and now I'm into the coaching part. <laughs> you know, to give quick, quick context for, you know, what our club is about, we, we basically have three pillars that we fall back on, um, you know, whether we're winning or whether we're losing, we always check in and, and say, are we at least doing these three things in the good times and the bad times? Um, and, and, and number one is, is we want to build from within, you know, and, and that's obviously, you know, everybody's brain shifts to players first when they hear that. Um, and, and our academy is, is really our, you know, our engine um, that kind of drives us forward. Um, but it's also for coaches uh, and, and, and sports performance staff and data analysts. We want players uh, and, and, and staff members to move up. So we always look within before we go. Uh, and recruit uh, maybe a kid in California or, or we draft a player from New York. Um, it's always that we'll look uh, inside. That's one of our, our, our real pillars. Um, we want to have a, a cohesive team as the second one. We, we believe that 11 players on the same page can beat any group of superstars and individuals. So that's a, a real thing that we, we really um, thrive on. And, and that goes to our, our style of play and our, our principles kind of fall under that. And then the third one's innovation. We have to find unique ways to um, get advantages over the teams uh, that you spoke about that are that are just going to buy um, big time players that have incredible talent. Um, we believe that you know if we find little advantages, whether it be in um, analytics, whether it be in our scouting department, whether it be in um, technology, um, and being kind of the, the cutting edge of that, um, we have to utilize that as a as an advantage. So now when you bring the whole package together. Um, we're able to punch above our weight and, and go against the, the LAFCs and Atlanta United who will, you know, spend $15 million transfer fees now and bring in top players. Um, you know, we've shown that we can play with those teams and beat those teams in, in big games. So, um, you know, I think that it's important to, to understand that, that part of things, um, you know, when we talk about what makes the Philadelphia Union kind of go. And we're not perfect and we don't have all the answers yet, but um, that's a quick little snapshot into um, our, our recruitment. Um, we do look, you know, obviously the term money ball is familiar with everybody now, but we do look to find players that, that we get a little bit more bang for our buck for sure. Um, you know, look, we have 13 countries represented in our roster right now, age 16 through 35. Um, uh, you know, through our sporting director, he's mined the leagues in the, you know, the second and third uh, Bundesliga. Uh, we have a player, for example, uh, one of our, our top players, uh, Jamiro Montero, um, was a $4 million transfer to Mets. You know, things didn't work out there with a the coach. Um, we don't really care about that and, and the right or wrong in that, but we see opportunity. So we, we bring a player of his quality and, and, and I believe, you know, he can play in any team in Europe, you know, so he has this talent and we find these types of guys. Um, we have a Brazilian player, El Sino, who, 
um, has played at Shakhtar Donetsk, has been in the Champions League, but the, you know, a, a situation like a, a war breaks out there and he wants safety for his family. Um, so we get him at a, we'll just say a much more discounted rate, you know, so we have to be creative um, in, in our recruitment. Um, you know, I, I won't go and bore you too much with the, the analytics side, but that's something that we're very big into. And, you know, we've come up with a, a number, you know, that's called a, the, the PUV, which is basically the Philadelphia Union value of a player. So um, it takes the principles that we see valuable, not what Toronto FC or Atlanta sees valuable or LA Galaxy sees valuable, but we see valuable within our style and the way we want to play. Um, and it puts a number to that. Um, and it's proven to be, look, it's not the answer to everything, but it, it narrows it down and it gets people in the door before we start to go travel and see them or meet with uh, the, the wife and the kids. So we have to be very creative in, in how we approach things. Um, it's a fun process though. And look, when, when everybody culturally within the club embraces it, um, it's a fun thing. And we, we see ourselves, yeah, a little bit as the underdog, but it's Philadelphia. It's emblematic of what the city is. Everybody thinks, you know, whether it's Rocky Balboa or Blue Collar or Tough, um, that's, that's what we are. And I think our staff and our players um, you know, are, are representative of the city itself. Our rules are, are very complex. Even the people that work day in and day out, um, you know, have to find unique ways to, to take advantage of them. And then when they find a, a, a good not loophole, but a, a way to approach things, um, they can change. You know, that's the one thing with our league. Um, it's still a young league, so there's there's constant adjustments. Um, we obviously have players like designated players. I'm sure everybody in Europe has at least heard that term where they can make an infinite amount of money, but they only hit your salary cap at, at X number. So, um, you know, those are usually the, the, the David Beckhams, the David Villas, you know, those types of guys that really can come in and, and influence uh, a team. Um, you know, the rest of your roster is made of, there's a, there's a term called TAM players, which is your, your middle tier European players that are in the, you know, 800,000 to one and a half million, and they hit the cap at a different number. I won't bore you with all the salary cap, but what it does do is it, it keeps a little bit of parity. Um, you know, there, there's not a club yet in our team and look, there's teams that consistently are, are doing well for sure, but there's no. You know, there's no Bayern Munich, there's no Man City that, you know, you look on paper and you say they're, they're probably going to be at the very top every year. Um, you know, as recently as, gosh, two years ago, Toronto won the league and then didn't make the playoffs. So um, there's ways that they have that keep it competitive for everybody, which is good. Um, look, our, our competitive advantage and our low hanging fruit um, isn't what you mentioned before to just go by. Ours is the academy. You know, we see real opportunity in that academy. Um, for those that maybe don't know in Europe, um, our salary cap is such where ex each team has a cap number, but your homegrown players, the ones you develop from your academy, count as zero on the cap. So I have eight or nine of them out there that are, you know, starting at different points of the year and they count for zero. So, and they're the kind of players too that, look, we aspire to create uh, the next Landon Donovan or Clint Dempsey, but if they're in our academy from age eight all the way through to the first team, um, I see that as the, the type of player that, um, you know, makes a coach sleep well at night. You know exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a good seven and a half, eight out of 10 every game. You know, it'll never be a four, but it might never be a 10, but he's going to be really solid for you on the day. So those are really important for us. Um, and that's one of the competitive advantages that we, we utilize um, and we believe in young players. And you have to throw them out there and give them opportunities and, and be brave as a, as a coaching staff to do that. And, and more times than not, young players, you'll, you'd be shocked. I, I think this applies in every company too. You give them an opportunity and sometimes they impress you, you know, and, and that's, that's been my, uh, my learning uh, through the years now as the, as the head coach here. You know, look, Jesse Marsh is a guy I played with for Gosh, eight seasons, uh, we're close friends to see his trajectory as a player and share the field with him and win some trophies together and now see what he's done in the coaching world at, uh, at Red Bull New York, Red Bull Leipzig, and now Red Bull Salzburg, you know, being the first American to, to lift a trophy in Europe. Um, I was just over there and saw them, you know, train for, for quite a bit and, and see their environment. Um, he's a big influence in my life. Um, 
he's older than I am. So he was kind of the one that put his arm around me when I was a player in Chicago um, and looked after me. Uh, and our friendship has grown through the years. And uh, we, we played on rival teams in the league, um, you know, as coaches. And that was always difficult. But at the same time, um, we stayed connected and, and together. So he's a big influence in, you know, my playing career and now um, the coaching career. He's always a phone call away. Um, a text with helping me because we do now have a, you know, Ernst Tanner who was from Red Bull Salzburg as well. Um, he's a, a text away. Jesse is from, you know, giving advice or tips or different things or dealing with the, you know, when we're a little bit narrow and how do we deal with long switches and how does the eight get out quick enough and, and different pressing points and all that stuff that comes up. Um, that's a great resource to have. Um, Raphael Vicky is another name that I, I've worked, uh, played with and now uh, watched his career coaching career from afar. He was at FC Basel. I took a trip over there. Um, and again, I try and do one of these trips every off season when he was in the Champions League and Basel was flying. Um, to see him work was really impressive. Um, I, I really liked how he worked. Greg Berhalter, our U.S. national team coach, is uh, you know, a, a colleague and a guy that um, I, I respect a great deal. And then globally, when you, you kind of zoom out and say, look, I don't have a relationship with any of these guys, but who do I really like? Um, Eddie Howe, I actually got to meet in person. We played Bournemouth here. And I'm not going to be a coach that goes and aspires to, look, I, I know Guardiola's great. I know Klopp's great. But they're at the the pinnacle, you know. And, and, and my club is is maybe structured and built differently that we're never going to have the, the, the trajectory that those clubs have. We have to find different ways to win, like we've talked about already. So Eddie Howe, for me, was an interesting one. He's a young coach. Um, he's progressive. Uh, watching his teams train here and how hard they work three sessions a day and just getting after it. But then also he won't remember it, but sitting next to him for a meal and I'm kind of picking his brain. And, um, you know, that was a great experience for me. So he's one that I always keep an eye on and, and really like how his teams play. Um, and look, they play brave. They get after it. They, they punch them up their weight. Like we, we like to think that we do. Um, he's a, a coach that I uh, aspire to, to, to be like. Um, you know, Pochettino for me is, is another one that I, I really like a lot. I liked how his Spurs teams played. Now they've gone kind of a completely different route, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, you know, uh, and then, you know, Marco Rose, who I've watched from afar now uh, because I'm implementing, you know, a lot of Red Bull uh, ideas in a 4-4-2 diamond. And he was kind of an expert in that at, at Salzburg and, and just his ability now at Gladbach to, to tweak things. I've watched a lot of his games. So I find inspiration in all these guys in, in different ways, but certainly the ones that are friends and, and colleagues are the ones that are, are easier because you get the inside access to, and you can, you can text them, you can pick their brain and gosh, in Salzburg, I can have a conversation with Jesse at two 30 in the morning over uh, different tactics and arguments and, and, and things like that. So those are the real special ones. The, the relationships that, that come out of that are important. This has become one of the most important positions on the field because um, it's it's become with everybody now um, being able to get behind the ball and, and, and be organized and, and play in really tight blocks. The only person on the field anymore that has time and space and can pick his head up and look forward and has things in front of him are the outside backs. So they've all become incredibly uh, much more um, involved on the ball and the data points to that now. They're usually the one or two in, in, in every game that, that you talk about now in terms of um, passes received and passes made. Um, conversely though, there's not a lot of good ones in the world, <laughs> I don't think so. And in particular in our league, um, it's, a, it's a weakness, it's a down position. So a lot of our game planning goes into how do we put the outside back on the ball and based on the data and on which side is, is weaker, um, we kind of do our pressing cues and set our traps based on that person in that position and, and their ability to not complete passes forward or diagonal, which one is their weakness. And we'll kind of set our whole game plan on that. So it's, it's an important position. It's one that's changed drastically now where you need to have an engine to really get up and down the, the line. For example, our team, we play a 4-4-2 and we're very, very narrow and our only width comes from them. So you talk about, you know, guys that are covering, you know, 12 to 13 kilometers a game, we really uh, demand a ton from them. So 
the game's changing. You know, even your center backs now have to be able to dribble and advance the ball um, and have to have a really comfort level to play through the lines. But the outside back position has is, is changed drastically. Um, I still, I don't want to be old school, but I still want guys that love to defend. You know, I still think it's important because there's so many great attackers now these days and, and on a weekly basis we're playing against you know, different wingers that are that are so hard to handle. So I like to get the defensive side right first, but it certainly is in the right moments. Getting them forward is, is critical. But talk about the change of a position over the past, you know, 10, 15 years. It's 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 night and day um, what's required of them and, and just the demands physically uh, to, to get up and down. The formation is just a starting point. So when the opening whistle blows, it's a starting point. But what really matters is, is the principles within that um, in that team and on that day against that opponent. So, um, you know, I used to be pretty rigid with the 4-2-3-1, but I've now kind of progressed and, and moved. We play a 4-4-2 diamond now, but it can it can in by six or, sorry, eight, six or eight yards look like a 4-3-3 almost instantly. It can look like a 4-3-1-2. You know, you can get caught in the semantics sometimes, uh, but at its most basic now, I think the modern game has shifted to, if you play a back four, that back four dictates how much space is gonna be in behind and how high or low the, the line is. And then essentially in front of that back four in the modern game, you have six guys that are really just hunting the ball. They're, they're, they're putting pressure in the ball in a smart way, obviously, and there's tactics involved and, and pressing cues. Um, but that back four really dictates things. The rest can be a little chaotic and it, it's not as static as it used to be because everyone has to run. You know, gone is the number, the days of the number 10 that just had a, a free roll and just stood there and only played offense and would always get open while um, the, the rest of the group was defending. Everybody has to defend now and everybody has to attack. So. Um, you know, oftentimes, and it's my biggest question I get from the press all the time, when, oh, you changed formation or you did this, it's, it, you're kind of going, if the principles are right and the players have bought into um, what we've done during the week of training, building up to it, they can adapt and adjust to almost anything on the fly. And that becomes more important, you know? Um, so simple things like if, if there's a negative pass, we're always gonna press. If there's a straight ball played by a player, uh, on an opponent, we are always going to press a straight ball because it's predictable and it's easy. Little little principles that you give them, um, you know, I think are more important now and, and res the players respond better to that rather than I'm um, just a number eight. We have so much interchange within our group um, as we've gone through the years. Um, it's It's been fun to, to kind of adapt and adjust. But I, I have to say early on in, you know, my first year as a head coach, it was pretty rigid and not much change. And um, we had some good success with it, but now that I see how the modern game has changed from transition and how quickly can you go from defense to attack and attack the defense, I think you have to be a lot more adaptable. Um, and, and the principles are really what it comes back to first and foremost. Well, it goes back to, for me again, um, we can talk a ton about tactics and it's important as a coach to have that part right, for sure, and formations and principles. But for me, every environment I've been to that's been successful, it still goes back to the relationships again. The relationships of players to coaches, the relationships of players to staff, and how do you motivate them every day to get the most out of them, to get their full potential. Um, you know, I know I said that might sound simple, um, but Every club, there, when, when there's a breakdown, it's always when a relationship goes south. So you really have to fight hard to avoid um, people going off, whether it's players or staff, in, in, in twos and threes and then starting to say, I'm not playing because of this or I don't like what the coach did on this. I didn't like training today. You really have to try to cultivate and create an environment where um, they kind of self-police and they self-regulate. Um, it's not easy to do, um, but for me, the modern coach, that's literally the most important thing and, and holding each other accountable every day. So I want my assistants to hold me accountable. Uh, I make big mistakes all the time. I don't have all the answers, um, but we all have to put our hand up when we do make mistakes as well. So 
Um, finding that accountability within the group, um, having players that, again, police the locker room themselves. I literally don't, at our training facility, we have this beautiful new, what, $30 million building. It's, it's awesome. I don't go in the locker room anymore. I, I, that's their space. They can, I know they talk about the coaching staff anyway, so they can talk about and joke about us all they want, but they know I give them that space. And when they come out of that locker room and we go to the training field, it's time to work and it's business. So um, I think you have to trust them, um, allow them to kind of self-regulate and you'd be surprised how, if you have a couple strong uh, leaders and, 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 and personalities, they can kind of pass on um, what you believe in. And that, that's been, you know, just my, my, um, my belief, you know, and again, I'm not here to tell you this is the only way I've had coaches that were literally dictators. You didn't see them during the week. They just picked the team and listen, they won games too, but that's not me as a coach. I believe more in uh, being open and organic and, and kind of growing with the players. They all have my cell phone. They all can call me, text me anytime um, with things on the field or off the field. And that's just the way I think um, works best. And it, it comes back to um, the relationships. I think it really comes down to that. Delegation has become a huge one for me. You have to get good at delegating, um, especially as a head coach. There's, there's a lot going on. There's press, there's media, there's sports performance department, there's diet, there's, there's a million different departments here. Um, and initially when I came into the job, I wanted to control everything. I was setting up every cone on the field and I wanted it to be my session. As, you, as time has gone by and I've read more and learned more about leadership, um, you have to really empower your staff. You have to empower your players and give them trust and let them fail and make mistakes, but let them do it on their own time. And, 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 and you'll be shocked at just how much, you know, look, there's assistant coaches that, oh shoot, he runs that training exercise way better than I do. Oh, good, let's give it to him. You know, it, it's, it's um, having the self-awareness and, and being humble um, in that the, the greater good of the team kind of comes better when you're maybe delegating and empowering others as well. So. And look, the, the, the way things are now in the coaching world and, and the, the business world, I can, I can go online and I can get, uh, I can, I can get a TED talk on, on anything, on leadership, on different topics. I can quote Malcolm Gladwell. I can come up with all these great ideas. I can literally put into Google, I can watch Bayern Munich's entire preseason on video and I, I have access to all this stuff. I can go on the coach's voice and I can look at top coaches, break down, you know, literally situations of individual plays. This is crazy. This, this did not exist for years, but now the challenge is everybody has this access and has this information. So as a coach now, what makes the good ones become great is it comes down to the relationships and what they get out of those every day. Um, when everyone has the access to all this stuff, um, how do you now, implement it and, and utilize it with people that you know and trust. That's really the, the biggest thing for me uh, and what makes a top coach. In order for the U.S. to become uh, a powerhouse, uh, I, I'm going to give a boring answer. It's, it's going to take time. Still, you know, we are behind in, in certain elements of the game in terms of youth development. Um, we still have the obstacles of, of kids play every sport here, you know, and it's a sporting culture, which is an advantage. Uh, but sometimes it can be a, a disadvantage as well um, because there's so much uh, that we're, we're passionate about in, in different sporting events. It's almost too, too sports based, to be honest. It's crazy, um, you know, but over time now, I, 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 I don't think it'll be too long. Um, I, I think we've made strides. Look, the game has grown in this country more than I ever thought it would already in my lifetime. Um, I look at our league now in MLS and you, you, you can tune in in the morning and the, you know, the, the English league is on in the beginning of the morning, the Bundesliga, you can watch three games and then MLS is on um, for three games into the night. And that never used to happen. I used to have to, you know, turn our TV to what was called UHF and then you'd get a fuzzy, you know, Italian league game, maybe one time on a Sunday. And I'd be watching that when I was little. So the growth has been amazing that you talk about the facility, the training facilities, um, the infrastructure, the stadiums are, are beautiful. The owners that are coming in have uh, real dollars and they're, they're very smart men. Um, you know, so it's growing. Um, I, I think everybody uh, too often in America wants to be the best right away. And it's, it's just not realistic. There's too many great leagues and it's going to take time. I think you're starting to see now a little bit of a shift where 
you know, younger players are looking to the States to come here to our league rather than uh, maybe aging superstars, which is a, a good first step. Um, but I still think we're a little bit away. Um, it is a sleeping giant. I think there is uh, a, a lot of talent here. Um, I still think we've gotten it wrong in terms of, you know, with such a big country, how do we, you know, kind of unify and get on the same page with things um, rather than, you um, making dollars and, and profit. You know, youth soccer over here is, is big business and, and clubs would rather keep a really special talent than have him go to a, a top club and maybe take pride in that, where I, I think it's a little different than it is in, in Europe where um, you guys are certainly ahead of us in that regard. So it's growing. Uh, I know that's a boring answer, but I think it's gonna take a little bit more time. Um, I don't think there's any you know magic bullet that's just gonna uh, we're going to snap our fingers and say the U.S. Is, is, is great. Look, we failed. We didn't qualify for the World Cup. You know, that has to be uh, pretty humbling in a, in a region that is not the most powerful in CONCACAF. So we have to step back, recognize some of the mistakes we have. We certainly have the talent. I think we have the, the coaching quality, but we have to uh, get a little more unified on, on things. I watch every league um, very closely. I, I, I love the Premier League. I love uh, I love the Bundesliga. I, I love you know you know watching just watching the game. Um, you know you, you try as a as a coach when we're scouting. We are kind of mining some of the the lower leagues as well, um, whether it be you know Chile or Ecuador or, or trying to find a diamond in the rough. Um, the reality is um, when I'm watching games and and, and being engaged and involved. I recognize if I turn on uh, the Bundesliga, that's probably not our our uh, target, you know, to, to, to scout in. Um, so I do watch a lot of other smaller leagues, um, League MX. Um, you keep an eye on even our lower leagues in the States, try to find maybe that um, player that's been overlooked or uh, is, is young and, and maybe an emerging talent. So I, I watch a lot of soccer. Um, we have great tools here to, that gets us all the, all the games all over the world. Um, you know, do I aspire to coach in Europe? Absolutely. I think every coach has to be motivated by getting to the highest level. Uh, and, and right now in our game, Europe is the highest level. There's no, no disputing that. Um, so that is something that I uh, aspire to. You're starting to see a little bit more opportunities and, and we need more coaches, you know, to have success there. That's what it really comes down to. Um, you know, in order to gain respect uh, of so many clubs with so much tradition and history and passion from the fans, um, we need coaches to go over and, and do well. Uh, I think, you know, Jesse, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, did that, you know, in lifting the trophy with, with Salzburg. But I certainly would love to, to test myself against the best. And, and, and right now, the, Europe is, is where the best are. This is a, tr a tricky one, you know. I think every pathway for every young coach is going to be different, um, but along that path, you have to you have to have uh, self awareness and, and and but be also brave enough to to ask to jo join into uh, you know a, an environment that you might think is is scary or foreign to you. You'd be amazed at how many coaches, if it's presented the right way to them, that you want to come in and learn and help, whether it be in analytics in the sports performance department. Uh, in a coaching department, they will give you an opportunity to do that. If you'll come in and work and put your head down and have the awareness to say, um, okay, I want to do my best here to help out and then maybe not be a, a loud and vocal voice right away. And, and, and having that, again, self-awareness of where you fit in in a group. So I would encourage all young coaches to dive into different environments. Um, don't be too too big when you finish your career to not be willing to work in a youth academy, um, to think that you can just jump right to the pros. I, I think you have to be humble in, in that regard. Um, you know, again, you don't have to have played the game at a pro level to become a great coach. There's millions of examples of that. Um, but I would also stress what you need to do is find something that separates you from, uh, from the rest. So what I mean by that is, 
I have tons of coaches that can run a great training session. You know, again, we talked about it. It's, there's access everywhere. There's not really any secrets anymore. Everybody can, can run a good training session now. But maybe do you separate yourself by being an expert in the, 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 the film software that we use, where you can pinpoint it and break it down for the head coach in a way that he goes, I'm taking that guy with me everywhere I go. Um, it, it's just a little tip that maybe I wish I had when I was younger. I just got thrown in at 34 and had to sink or swim in, in some regard. Um, but if, if someone would have told me that, uh, number one, be brave enough to ask to, and humble enough to do an internship or dive in at a club and, and, and find a way. But then also go in there and, and, and find what that club needs and how they work. And, and do, do that one thing that separates you from everybody else that'll you know give you the benefit of the doubt or the nod. Because there's tons of good coaches out there that can run training sessions, but now what do you do that separates yourself from, from the rest?